So I see Asutosha, did you want to comment on this? I see you've had your hand up for a little bit. As we are working from a bank side investigation, how we can we can provide some insight, how we can reach to reasonable ground to suspect from our side, looking at the activity and what kind of activity we should look into. I, I think it's difficult because banking, you see a lot of other transactions. So let's just say someone's dealing on the dark net. You're not going to see a lot of their cryptocurrency activity unless they're trying to cash out to your bank. But you might see things like extra postage, shipping. You might see things like purchasing a VPN or post office boxes, like things that wouldn't normally uh, raise suspicion, but along with possible cryptocurrency transactions. And in regards to reasonable grounds of suspicion, you have to think of where the, usually it's the origin of funds for money laundering that we're concerned about. So finding out what the origin of funds were. If someone said, oh, I bought cryptocurrency back in 2017, that's all well and great, but usually they have to do it with fiat funds unless they're mining. So asking them, well, uh, I bought it from someone on the street, $10,000 worth. Okay, show me the cash withdrawals from your banking institution that validate that information. So knowing what probing questions to ask to really zero in on the source of funds. If they just say, I don't have any information or I can't give you maybe my wallet that I used to originally purchase the cryptocurrency from, that's when that's when the reasonable grounds of suspicion starts kicking in, when their story doesn't match up or can't be verified either by block on the blockchain or based on, you got a lot more information based on uh, the different accounts that they're using. Thank you. Really helpful. One of the one of the funny bits that I would add to that, just in terms of crypto businesses and and money service businesses generally, is that we see some really what I would consider just as a business person and an entrepreneur, crazy things that people do. And and I look at it and I think no rational person should be doing their transactions this way. Um, but most businesses haven't had five bank accounts closed. Um, so for me as a compliance consultant, when I walk into my bank. I have no motivation to lie to my bank about what I'm doing or why I'm doing it. Or like, it's very easy. It's very transparent. Um, one of the difficult things I think for some of these businesses is that they haven't experienced that, you know, they've said Bitcoin and boom, your account is closed. And that creates this really bizarre situation where we have legitimate businesses. We have legal businesses that are operating and, and doing things that look criminal because they don't believe that they can be transparent. Um, so teeing back to, to Jennifer's question earlier about, you know, is it time for banks to start banking these businesses? Um, yes, I, I would argue that we create a situation where it becomes more difficult to identify actual criminal activity. And quite frankly, it becomes more difficult to protect consumers. So in that way, like banks are not ready yet to uh, like, you know, bank any crypto uh, exchanges for companies or is just their risk tolerance doesn't uh, like you know, allow them to bank i i think i think they could i i think that's a choice this is this is my um, um my opinion on this one is that i i think there's um disparate motivations that come into play um i think that crypto companies and money service businesses offer services that are competitive to banks and so it's difficult you know to be motivated to serve your competitor um, I think okay. from a risk perspective, I know from the, the Canadian side, we definitely have regulators that will go in and say, give us a list of your MSPs um, as one of their the questions that FinTrack likes to ask during exams. Um, so the uh, part, of, part of the issue is that as a banker, you're caught between a regulator and a hard place. So even if you have the most fantastic risk management program, if you know that it's something that's going to cause friction in your regulatory exams, you might make different choices about it. But it takes extra money, extra resources, extra expertise that the banks really, the, the equipment is expensive. Blockchain analytic tools aren't cheap. Uh, so if the banks just say, we don't bank cryptocurrency companies, that's a lot easier than training up your staff to be able to handle the suspicious indicators of the activity by crypto companies. If I can add to that, <clears throat> there's, you know, I worked at banks and uh, one, our bank in particular didn't deal with MSBs or crypto and there was no appetite to it very, for the very reasons that Amber and Stephen mentioned, right? You can't, it's, it's difficult to say we're gonna dip our toe in the water, right? There's a significant undertaking in terms of training, in terms of systems, in terms of changing your risk appetite uh, entirely when you're dealing with those types of uh, entities. 
so it's not it's not easy to do you know i think we've we pushed and i certainly pushed for is there a way to possibly get into strategic alliances with some of these crypto companies and offer you know a, a, a hybrid type account where they could um, work together and there was just no appetite to do it uh, for, for all those reasons from both the business and the compliance side and and banks by nature are a little bit slow to um, adapt to change with uh, various silos so I can see that being an issue Giles I, I know you have a great deal of experience with this some experience I'm learning every every day <laughs> there are banks big banks in Canada one or two of them who are banking crypto um, so yes it does I think it does come down partially to the risk appetite the risk tolerance of any particular bank that you might be talking about there are even other smaller Canadian banks who've actually specifically gone in to focus on banking what we would traditionally consider to be higher risk types of entities, money service businesses, cannabis, crypto. The one or two groups I've seen that have secured banking with the big five Canadian bank have been completely open and transparent about their business and have invested a lot of time up front in their AML programs and haven't tried to skirt around the, the issue, quote unquote, of being a cryptocurrency business at all. Like the banks have been acting as the kind of de facto regulators for, for a good couple of years now. And what I mean by that is you know, any of these groups who have approached the banks, they've always been saying, okay, well, show us your AML program, walk us through it. They've actually been setting the standards in, 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 in absence of any regulation. So there have been good attempts to get to grips with it so far, and I think it will continue. So you bring up uh, the regulations. So we've got um, crypto being considered MSBs and uh, and coming under regulations shortly. I've had a question come in um, that says, uh, do, the, do the pros in the room feel that Canadian regulators are prepared to interpret the intelligence that they will be receiving from virtual currency providers or exchanges? So we've, we're going to flip it on its head so we try and gather the data we try and make it legitimate and then now that we get it will the right people be able to do the right things with that info any takers no takers i'll, I'll pipe up how's that since i am on some of the fintrack working committees um they have admitted to saying that they are acquiring tools to be able to um, deal with cryptocurrencies but they're not there yet um, now, whether they've acquired them or not, that was as of January. Um, they are in, with the intent of doing that between June 1st, 2020 and June 1st, 2021, um, because that's when the regs are, are kicking into actual um, changes to the reporting system. So I think they're getting prepared. If they're there today, no, they're not. I, th I think they're getting more prepared, but to add to what Joseph just said, I, I was impressed with what the RCMP is doing to get more prepared. So they now have so like a, a human who's in the role of national <laughs> cryptocurrency coordinator. Um, so, so her job is to be aware of these things, to make sure police forces are trained, to build um, a, a database of all of the virtual asset service providers that they're going to be sending information requests to um, and, and start to do that type of liaison work. And I, I think that's pretty cool. I, th I think we're far behind as a, as a nation. And Melanie can back me up with on this. I think we receive a lot of law enforcement requests from all around the world, usually in UK, Spain, uh, Germany, obviously the US, who's aggressively going after cyber criminals. Whereas we, I, I think most exchanges will attest to that. They don't receive as many inquiries from uh, Canadian, either whether it's regulators, regulators or law enforcement. So I think there's isolated cases where we've done well, but I think around the world we're, we're far behind when it comes to investigating cryptocurrency. And it may just be biased because it's the only things that are going through our exchange, which isn't um, really advertising to Canadian customers. But I think the regulators are just making sure they have the information. If something huge blows up, like a big Ponzi scheme, that they have the information to go after something like that. Other than that, I don't think they're going after uh, the majority of the crime that's happening in cryptocurrency, in my opinion. I agree there. Yeah. They're only going after the. They're only going after pits right now, um, and I think that's just because the reporting isn't there, right? So once the reporting kicks in, I think they'll get it. Those other jurisdictions you're talking about, they have reporting already. So uh, I think 
as we get to the point where uh, exchanges are reporting June 1st, 2021, um, we'll start seeing a lot more law enforcement action for sure. Um, I know the OPP here in Ontario, uh, they're already well ahead. They've prosecuted, the Attorney General has prosecuted people, seized crypto assets. They're liquidating those crypto assets um, and they're doing it in a way that is pretty interesting. Um, so the OPP is there, they know about it, they, they, they can track it, they can seize it, they can put it in their own cold wallets, they can do all that stuff.